snipers and bombers of the IRA have killed nearly 300 British soldiers since troops were sent to Northern Ireland 10 years ago. 220 policemen and reserve soldiers have also died. The public has never found out what the British Army thinks about its main adversary. The official line has usually been that the IRA can and will be beaten. Now an army intelligence document has come to light that reveals what the army really feels about the provisional IRA. World in Action has acquired the full text of the secret report. It contains some startling assessments. The provisional IRA has the dedication and the sinews of war to raise violence, certainly for the foreseeable future. And the prediction? The provisional's campaign of violence is likely to continue while the British remain in Northern Ireland. The author was Brigadier, now General, James Glover, Commander, Land Forces, Northern Ireland. He uses unprecedented language to describe the enemy. He says they're talented and dedicated. They'll continue to recruit enough educated men with bomb-making and sniping skills to increase their professionalism. British politicians have often claimed that the IRA is finished Roy Mason, former Secretary of State, speaking in 1976 on the record of the security forces. Morale is good, recruitment is good. And I think that they've got the IRA in particular reeling, and I think also that the, within Northern Ireland the propaganda war is being won, and that the uh, extremists on both sides are now worried because peace is beginning to break out. They also suggest that the IRA are simply mindless psychopaths from Northern Ireland's ghettos. Former Ulster Secretary Merlin Rees after a particularly vicious provisional atrocity. Tonight is sheer murder of the sort of thing we've read of in the United States. It is not political. It is gangs of people behaving as Al Capone behaved in the United States. The ordinary men and women of the province have shown a sense of responsibility and very real courage in resisting the pressures of bully boys and thugs. Present! Oh. The army, which has to face the IRA on the ground, is less scornful of their capabilities. In the report, General Glover writes bluntly, Our evidence of the calibre of rank-and-file terrorists does not support the view that they are merely mindless hooligans drawn from the unemployed. He describes the provisional's new battle order of active service units as follows. The active service units are for the most part manned by terrorists tempered by up to 10 years of operational experience. The army said we could talk to soldiers in Ulster about the issues raised in General Glover's report. His pessimistic forecast about the IRA in the 80s is already coming true. This year's death rate among the security forces has been double that of 1978. Many of the victims have died in the deceptively peaceful countryside around Armagh. Colonel Peter Trenier Michel, 2nd Battalion Royal Green Jackets, on his fourth Ulster tour, confirmed that the IRA were proving a tough nut to crack. They are bombing with car bombs and incendiaries and they're shooting in a thoroughly cowardly manner are off-duty members of the security forces, particularly the UDR and the RUC Reserve. How many men have you got to cope with this? I've got here, uh, myself, around about 600. Why can't you deal with it? Because it is very difficult to, uh, with a terrorist organisation, um, you need extremely good intelligence. Um, and without that really first-class intelligence, you can have double the number of men, and you would still be very difficult to find them. Major Peter Lydon, C Company commander, told us how he saw his enemy, the provisional IRA, known as Pyra. In this area, um, they seem to be quite effective. Uh, within Dungannon, we actually have a number uh, of provisional IRA planners uh, from the East Tyrone Pyra, um, actually living in the town. Do you see them, meet them? We see them day to day, yes. Um, uh, some of them working in the town, but most of them 
on a Wednesday collecting their brew money. What's that? That's their, uh, their social security benefits. Why don't you arrest them? Well, we're not able to as such because uh, in law, and of course, as you know, we act within the law in Northern Ireland, they haven't actually done anything overtly wrong. According to General Glover, there are about 60 IRA men in this battalion's area, nearly half operating from across the nearby border with the Irish Republic. The local Catholic population gives the army little or no information about them. His report says the army has in general scant knowledge of the IRA's supply lines from the south and few details of the IRA hierarchy in Dublin. The SAS, famed secret anti-terrorist force of the British army, has not a single man in the area, we were reliably told. With internment ended, all the army can do is search for hard evidence that will satisfy a judge, and the hunt is dangerous. More bombs are now triggered by photoelectric cells or radio-controlled, like one that killed a soldier this weekend. These soldiers hunt for bombs, spread out to reduce casualties if one explodes. Bombs, ter I mean, they terrify me. Uh because it, it, I mean, it's not necessarily going to kill you like a well-aimed shot. It's, it might just blow you, you know, your legs off, your arm off, or you know, rupture you for life. Um, but you may not necessarily die. And I'd, I'd hate to be crippled. Although sometimes I think, you know, I, I get pictures of me flashing, lying in the road, torn to pieces, and it just, it just terrifies me. I don't, I don't like them at all. Senior officers in London said they'd like a way to be found for the army to end its dangerous and unrewarding role in Ulster. After the search, we talked to the company sergeant major about the IRA. Um, there's been a vast improvement. Tactically, they're more sounder now than they was. Um, we've got a lot more difficulty pinning them down. We're not getting much information. Uh, so, basically, they're a lot more organised. The information isn't coming out, which means that they're more security conscious. What would you attribute that, that to? Um, well, they're possibly the maze. People that go to the maze tend to come out of it a lot more organised. The maze seems to be a training ground for the IRA. <laughs> Armoured cars and tanks and guns came to take away our sons, but every man would stand behind the men behind the wire. Through the little streets of Belfast in the dark of early morn, British soldiers came marauding, tracking little homes with scorn, heedless of to gauge the Republican view of General Glover's report, we went to West Belfast. Here, a campaign centres on the Mays Prison, known as Long Kesh. 350 men are refusing to wash and smearing excrement on walls, trying to get prisoner of war status. General Glover describes such men as dedicated and likely to go straight back into action when released. Some 400 will be due for release by 1982. Mr Edward Digney, whose son was jailed on a bombing charge, confirms that prison is not reforming the IRA. The mood is fantastic. The mood is just, uh, it's indescribable. They're 10 feet tall. Uh, one would actually think that they were coming out of uh, one of the holiday camps or somewhere, rather than out of uh, the Long Cash, uh, you know, a, a hellhole like that. Uh, words, you know, just words fail me. I, I'm going up, I'm expecting to see my son coming out dejected, and I'm expecting to see other lads whom I know in this area who usually come out at the same time. I'm expecting them to come out, you know, with yuck, they're, they're beaten sort of ways, they're cowed down, the conditions, the deprivation they've got to them. It's no way. Actually, my son is looking happier and more, more uh, vitalised than I am. The document reveals the IRA are 500 strong and says they have the sinews of war to keep on fighting. Father Desmond Wilson of the Bally Murphy, who rejects the use of violence, endorses General Glover's view. I agree, yes. My own assessment of the situation, having seen this for a number of years, is that indeed they could wage war, and probably will, because uh, a guerrilla army like this becomes more and more sophisticated. Either you beat them early on, or you don't beat them at all. 
And so um, as, as the means of getting arms uh, become more perfect and as the sophistication and the intelligence increase, an army becomes, I believe, uh, practically unbeatable. Mrs Mary McCleary has lived in the Ballymurphy most of her life. She has no IRA connections, but knows the level of their support in the community. A small minority would support their methods. What proportion would passively support them? Sixty mm, percent. Remember, this is only an estimate. An army report says the IRA has the dedication and sinews of war to wage war for the foreseeable future. Does that surprise you? The surprising thing is, is that it's taken the army so long to realize that. Why do you think it has taken them that long? The army has the reputation for being silly bullies. They think they, think they can't be beaten. Or they, and no one has the power to keep them at full stretch for very long. Can you ever see a community like Bally Murphy turning its back on the IRA, irrespective of the killings and bombings that it carries out? This community? No, I can't. Because remember, the provisional IRA is this community. They belong here. They're, they're part of it. They're not people coming in from outside. They, they are part of this community. Killings, bombings, atrocities and all. Yes. You've got to accept all parts of your community. Who's got a husband in Long Cash here? Me. What's he in for? Um, he's in for a membership of the professional ARA. And uh, how often do you go and see him? Once a week. And who organises the visits for you? Um, the incident centre, the Champagne centre. They look after you? Yeah. <laughs> Does the Republican movement uh, give you enough money to live on while your men are in jail? Yes, they do. In the Falls Road, relatives of the prisoners in Long Kesh talked gratefully of the regular funds that reached them from the Republican movement. That's another issue raised in the Glover report. It says the provisionals have now established a solid, if unorthodox, financial structure. In Republican areas, it says taxes pay a levy. Business rackets bring in a quarter of a million pounds a year, but those are just trimmings. IRA bank raids in Ulster and the Republic netted £2 million last year. IRA men, says General Glover, now expect a weekly £20 wage and expensive weapons. Behind the successful bank raids, says the General, lies a new and almost informer-proof system. The IRA have regrouped into small, distinct cells, totally isolated from one another. Even the much-praised SAS surveillance techniques, he implies, can't crack it. The result? The British Army face a tightly-knit and security-conscious enemy. The Army report says that IRA security is much tighter than it's ever been. What, is it, what evidence is there of that? The fact that you don't know who's in the IRA and who isn't. There was a time when you could tell who was an official, who was a provisional. Now you can't tell who's a provisional. Even a neighbour, for example? Yes. A neighbour who you've lived next door to all your life? Yes. The General also names the man who devised this system, Jerry Adams. Adams, now aged 31, started off as a non-violent Republican. He's still Vice President of Provisional Sinn Féin. Here he is at a press conference for a man released from Long Cash. Mason is going, the blanket protesters are still there, the people are still in the streets, and that the issue which put people like John into jail has not been resolved, and it won't be resolved until the British decide that they're going to withdraw. Thank you, gentlemen. Nine months ago, Jerry Adams was acquitted in a Belfast court of belonging to the IRA, but the army still think he's running it. Lieutenant Colonel Trenier Michel, Royal Green Jackets, who served in Ulster for six years. Who is Jerry Adams? Jerry Adams, we think, is the boss, if you like, of the IRA. I wouldn't use the word commander. He's a gangland boss. And he uh, bosses, um, we believe, the whole IRA cam military campaign and probably the political campaign in the North. What's your proof? I have none. That's a personal feeling, and I think um, it is backed up by a certain amount of information. What's he like? I've met him in Belfast on a couple of occasions. He's a clever man. I think he's a dedicated revolutionary, um, criminal revolutionary. Uh, he knows exactly what he wants, 
Um, and he doesn't care how he gets it. The ends justify the means. Is he cleverer than you? I think probably much, very cl much cleverer than me, yes, I think so. Last month, we photographed Jerry Adams at a top provisional rally at Bowdenstown near Dublin. With him were four men closely associated with the IRA. Rory O'Brody, long-time public spokesman of the provisionals. Joe Cowell, former Belfast Brigade commander of the IRA. Sean McStephen, former IRA chief of staff. David O'Connell, former IRA chief of staff. Adams took a Marxist line, workers' control of a united Ireland. The British should be pushed out of the north by force. He ended, victory to the IRA, victory to the people. Father Wilson of Bally Murphy. Do you know Jerry Adams? I do, yeah. Would you describe him as a mindless hooligan? <laughs> no way, no way. I remember in 1970, um, attending a public meeting at a time of very high tension, Jerry Adams was nearly put out of the, that meeting because he was advocating that people should use peaceful means to settle their differences uh, rather than to take to the streets. Father Wilson said he'd seen many men like Adams turn to arms because peaceful means held out no hope of political change. Those men took up arms very reluctantly and they're some of the men who took up arms that I would trust with my own life today whereas I would not trust the politicians who drove them to those things. Is Jerry Adams one of those men? One of the men I would trust? Yes, he is. Under Adams, the IRA have become better armed. General Glover's report costs every weapon from a heavy magnum pistol to sophisticated night sights. He warns that the IRA may soon get a new laser sniper scope and estimates the IRA has 5,000 weapons. The army displayed IRA firepower for us. This is the M3 submachine gun, silenced version, as we showed you. Now, that's used for, for killing uh, people when they want to plant a bomb uh, without arousing the... Uh, without raising the alarm. That sort of situation for a submachine gun, in other words, close quarter cover, or if you want to go in and kill off a few people in a, in a close room, anything like this, mainly as a, a protection weapon as well. Obviously quite useful. This Chinese AK-47 assault rifle is now being bought by the IRA from the Middle East arms markets. This Armalite is standard US Army issue. Deadly accurate up to 250 meters, it's the IRA's main sniping weapon. The high velocity bullet makes a fist size wound. It's killed more British soldiers than any other IRA gun. The army showed us further how the technology of war was escalating. It was as if they wanted to emphasize that the war for Britain would be long drawn out and costly in money and lives. Already, Northern Ireland is costing the British taxpayer nearly a thousand million pounds a year. These Wessex helicopters cost 3,600 pounds an hour to fly. They can drop a squad of troops unexpectedly on any area of the province. But now these great machines too are threatened. In his report, General Glover warns that the provisionals may acquire a handheld SAM-7 ground-to-air missile to shoot down troop-carrying helicopters. They're particularly vulnerable to SAM-7s because of the way their exhaust gases escape. We questioned an Army Air Corps pilot about this new development. Now, uh, the provisionals are said to want to get hold of a SAM-7 heat-seeking missile. Yeah. Um, on, on that side, we have had countermeasures for that, um, to my knowledge, for at least um, six or seven years. I, I, I was last year four years ago, and we had it then, and I believe it's been in for, for, for several years. We do have measures that we can take against that. Can you describe those measures? Um, all I can say, basically, is that the missile relies on heat, is heat-seeking. Basically, we blank off the heat source. 
We asked General Glover in person about his remarkable document when we met by chance near Amar. He asked not to be questioned on his statement that the IRA campaign of violence would continue as long as Britain remained in Ulster. That was political, he said. But privately, the army said that his report, prepared in consultation with the Director of Military Intelligence for Northern Ireland, did represent the army's view. We asked the new Northern Ireland Secretary, Humphrey Atkins, about the security situation and General Glover's assessment. Do you think the provisionals can ever be beaten? Yes. Why? Because um, I think that one, if one can be effective in one's operation, uh, I'm, I think one can beat them. Um, yeah, I'm afraid it's going to take a little time. I don't say that they will cease to exist. When I say beaten, I think what I mean is that the amount of damage they are able to inflict on the community will be reduced to, to so much that it really won't constitute a threat to a normal way of life, as it does at the moment. What about General Glover's remarks of his assessment that they have the dedication and the sinews of war to wage war for the foreseeable future? Well, they, that, that, that may be the, the case. I mean, this, this, is, this is his opinion, but it doesn't mean to say you can't beat him. Would you say that General Glover has a, a good grasp of the nature of the conflict in Northern Ireland? I'm sure he has. The otherwise, the Ministry of Defence wouldn't have sent him there. Would you regard him as an expert on the issue? Yes, he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a major general, he's a very able soldier, uh, and uh, absolutely certainly he's, uh, he wouldn't have got to that position if he hadn't been really efficient and, and able at his job. Of course he wouldn't. Well, now his view, and I quote him again, the provisional's campaign of violence is likely to continue as long as the British remain in Northern Ireland. Why do you say, then, that they can be beaten? Because it isn't just a military problem, this. <clears throat> it's a problem where... The, uh, the police, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, have a very, very important role to play. And you see, what we're seeking to do is not to beat them in a kind of military battle. Uh, they're being tackled on the basis of the operation of the law. Uh, and that is where the police have such a crucial role to play, because what we're seeking to do is, is to catch them and bring them to justice. And, you know, there is really quite a, an impressive record of success. I mean, for example, last year, no less than 876 people were convicted in the courts of terrorist crimes. Would you say that the provisionals are politically motivated? No, I wouldn't, because um, they've got no political motivation, as we understand it. In fact, uh, Jerry Adams, one of the leading people, made a speech at Bodenstown about a fortnight ago when he made it quite clear that he wasn't attempting just to drive the British out of Northern Ireland or anything like that because he said that if that was achieved and there was, for argument's sake, a united Ireland of 32 counties, he'd destroy that too. They're, they are just in the business of destruction. Would you say, therefore, that they're mindless? Well, to my way of thinking, yes. How good do you think that British intelligence network has been in the Ireland conflict over the last 10 years? Well, I think the answer to that must be that it isn't good enough. I don't suppose it ever is, but I don't think it is good enough at the moment. We would always like more intelligence. It is a key to uh, operations of this kind, and indeed we are studying the matter at the moment to see how we can improve it. Well, our General Glover says in his report, and I mm. quote, we know little of the detailed workings of the hierarchy in Dublin. He's talking about the IRA. Mm. Mm. In particular, we have scant knowledge of how the logistical system works. Mm. It's a pretty appalling confession, isn't it? Well, after 10 years? that's um, it, 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 because they've they've uh, they have reorganised themselves, uh, and um, one of the difficulties, of course, is that uh, it, it appears that a lot of the work that is done in training and reorganising and, and and planning and so forth is not done in a country over which we have any jurisdiction. Do you think it's time the British thought about withdrawing? No. Why not? Because. Uh, th depends what you mean by withdrawal. If you mean withdrawing troops, um, then troops will be withdrawn when the security situation allows. That is the whole intention. If you mean political withdrawal, which is another matter, the answer is no. If the majority of the population of the province wish to remain part of the United Kingdom, as they do, then we will remain there. Of course we will, politically. If a day ever comes, and I don't know whether it will, that the majority of the population of the province say, no, we want not to be part of the United Kingdom, we want to go somewhere else, well, that's quite a different matter, but that day hasn't come. With only two months in office, 
Mr Atkins has yet to come forward with political proposals for Northern Ireland. But as he works on long-term solutions, he has to face the fact that some of his main army advisers believe a final military defeat of the IRA is impossible.